in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and good morning to everybody on the webinar. This is Lauren Wenzel from the National Marine Protected Areas Center, and uh, we're very happy to be hosting this webinar today, uh, along with our partners at EBM Tools Network and Open Channels, so thank you. And also thanks to Joanne Flanders here at NOAA, who's done a lot of legwork in pulling the webinar topics together. I'm really pleased today to introduce our speaker. It's Elsa Halbold, and she is the National Landscape Conservation Co Cooperative Coordinator and has been since September 2013. And I'll introduce her in just a second. Um, the topic today is Integrating Oceans into the Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And what I wanted to do is um, just let you know that we're going to have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of this presentation, so please feel free to type your questions into the question box on the webinar panel. Um, you can do that any time during the presentation, and then we'll uh, facilitate the Q&A session after Elsa has finished her presentation. So um, Elsa is the National LCC Coordinator, and she works at the Fish and Wildlife Service. Previously, she worked for 12 years on marine and terrestrial wildlife diversity and endangered species issues at the state, regional, and national level with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Uh, she also has NGO experience and has volunteered with and then coordinated the Texas Marine Mammal Stranding Network for more than a decade. And she has a BS in Wildlife and Fisheries Science and an MS in Veterinary Anatomy from Texas A&M. So really pleased to have you here today, Elsa, and I will turn it over to you. But we're not hearing you, so I'm just making sure you're not on mute. Elsa? Can you make sure that uh, you didn't put yourself on mute? All right. Just ask folks to uh, be patient here for a minute. Sarah, do you have any advice uh, here? I don't. She, um, she turned off her cell phones, unfortunately. It would just be to call her and see if we can figure out what was up. She Okay, so she can hear us, and she's not muted on her phone. Um, Elsa, maybe it would work to try calling back in. Um, just hang up the telephone, and then um, look on the, under the audio panel of the user interface and call back in and enter your PIN number again. So just ask you all to be patient for a couple minutes while we get our speaker back on the line. And I would say that um, we could just use this time for a quick infomercial. If folks do have suggestions for future webinar topics, we're always interested in hearing what those are, so you can also feel free to, to type those into the comment box as well. We're going to be lining up speakers for the next several months, so we already have some scheduled that I think are going to be really interesting. Uh, lots, of, lots of topics, including a talk from the Gulf of Farallones on their climate adaptation work. And uh, later on in the summer, we're going to be hearing about the National Park Service Centennial and their plans for the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Park Service. So, um, Howdy. this is Elsa. I've dialed back in. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Okay, good. Okay, great. Then I'm handing it over to you, Elsa, and thanks for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you. It's great to see so many folks on this webinar, um, and really nice to see some some folks I used to work with a long time ago. So. I'm uh, talking today mostly about landscape conservation cooperatives, but also from more of the marine and, and coastal perspective. So I wanted to start with just um, some background on what the LCCs are. I know there's, they've been around about five years now, but there's still, um, still a lot to be learned about what they are, and um, I'll do that. And then 
what I'm going to do is provide some case examples, just a, a, a few representative examples of where LCCs have worked uh, with NOAA specifically and with a lot of the different marine protected areas. So we have uh, 14 of our 22 LCCs are actually coastal in nature, and uh, most of those spread out to uh, pretty far out um, to sea as well. So we'll go ahead and get started here. We do have a long legacy of success in conservation in overcoming some of the challenges that we've seen. We still face numerous challenges, but uh, those have been exacerbated by some of the, the climate change factors that we're uh, addressing now, including sea level rise that many of you are, are experiencing firsthand, genetic isolation, invasive species, et cetera. All of that is compounded by this rapidly changing climate. And so there has to be solutions uh, to do this. We can't continue to do the, the conservation the way that we've done it in the past and expect to address some of these, these new challenges. We're going to have to develop new tools and new ways of working together to uh, determine how to overcome some of these challenges. So over the past few decades, the, the concept of landscape conservation has been, has been discussed and bantied around. And, and um, in 2009, the Secretary of Interior at that time, Ken Salazar, uh, established the Landscape Conservation Cooperative Network. And they've spent the last five years really, uh, really getting themselves established and as a, as a group of 22 self-directed partnerships came together and established a vision for the entire LCC network. And that is what you see here on the screen, landscapes and seascapes capable of sustaining natural and cultural resources for current and future generations. So again, this gives you a sense, this map of where the LCCs are. It's uh, the geographies were determined largely on bird conservation regions uh, that had been previously established and are really sort of on an ecological basis, eco-region basis, as opposed to following just some sort of um, jurisdictional line, such as a state boundary or a federal region uh, for a particular agency. So there's tremendous involvement in the LCCs that, that's evolved over the past five years. There's over 270 agencies and organizations involved. All 50 of the state natural resources agencies participate in some manner in the LCCs. Many of them serve as chairs of the steering committees for those 22 LCCs. All of the major federal resource management and conservation agencies are participating, including NOAA and all of those that you see listed here. We have a good tribal participation. We'd like to increase that. There's good NGO participation. We also have reached out to and are working closely with many existing long-standing partnerships, such as the uh, Migratory Bird Joint Ventures and the Fish Habitat Partnership. We also have uh, tremendous academic contributions to the LCCs, and then are partnering with uh, other climate change-related partnerships, such as the Climate Science Centers from the Department of Interior, NOAA's RESA's program, and then USDA's Climate Hub. So again, good participation across the LCC network. So what is the LCC network? It's that map of the 22 individual LCCs that I showed to you originally. Uh, each one of those LCCs is designed to tackle conservation challenges for cultural and natural resources at the, at the local level, at the scale of that particular landscape conservation cooperative. And so the partners that come to the table there form a steering committee um, that represents the, the, the cultural and natural resource needs of that particular geography. Each of the 22 LCCs has a steering committee comprised of these partners. They also have a coordinator and a science coordinator. Some of them may have communications coordinators, um, other technical staff such as GIS support. Um, and then most of the LCCs also have technical committees that are comprised of the partnerships that come to the table and bring their expertise to to collectively harness all of that expertise and, and build things that they wouldn't be able to do on their own. In addition, we have the LCC network operations, which um, we have all of the coordinators are a part of a coordinators team that meets monthly. All of the science coordinators are part of a science team that also meets monthly. And then each of those groups is represented by a few of their peers in an executive committee that really helps uh, move the LCC network uh, forward collectively together of um, with all those LCCs. 
The LCC network is staffed by myself. I'm the national LCC network coordinator, and then we have an assistant national coordinator, uh, Ben Thatcher, and a, a staff person named Megan Cook, who's phenomenal, all of them are, um, and then some other support as well that help with network operations. But again, all of this is, is bringing those LCCs together to form this LCC network. And then more recently, last year, we stood up the LCC Council, which is a higher level policy body of folks that are comprised of state fish and wildlife agency directors, as well as federal agency directors. And uh, you can see the list of some of the folks that we have uh, engaged here. We also have uh, Canadian representation and are seeking um, a representation from Mexico. So this is truly an international effort and uh, involves tribes as well as the, the federal and state folks. And again, this group has really been stood up to help the LCC network succeed, really find places where there might be challenges or where there might be opportunities that, that they at a higher level can help the LCC network overcome to move forward with, with um, securing the future for conservation. You might have seen the National Fish, Wildlife, and Plants Climate Adaptation Strategy that was released in 2013. One of the things that it, it this was a multi-partnership um, um, strategy that was created by NOAA, the US Department of Interior, as well as the states through the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and, and numerous other partners. And one of the things they identified in there was specifically was the LCC network and identified us as a forum to help design um, sustainable landscapes for the future at a, at a regional level. So last year we came together again. We're, we're still developing and, and forming and, and uh, learning what we are and coming together as a network. And so it was time to create a, an LCC network strategic plan. And I've got all the, the gibbery words here that, that say what the four goals are of the strategic plan. But I, I tend to like, and, and some folks are more visual, and really like to use the shorthand version, which talks about the four goals as the conservation strategy, which is helping develop those designs, uh, the collaborative conservation, which I can't overemphasize the importance of the, of the collaborative nature of the LCC network. There's a science goal, which also includes traditional ecological knowledge in helping advance conservation, and then communication. And so these are the four areas that that LCC network collectively of the, the 22 LCCs come together and are, are attempting to achieve. In addition, the science coordinators recognized that the, at the bottom of the slide, you can see uh, four different science plans from four LCCs. And they've, they've all identified their priority needs and the, and the priority science for their landscape, for, their, for the regions that they're working on. But it was recognized that we needed an LCC network science plan as well. And so this is under development and should be available in the next few months or so. Uh, the science coordinators have sent out the, a draft plan last year and asked for input, and they received over 600 comments on it. I'm sure some of you provided some of that, that much helpful information. But these are the themes that the LCC network science are going to revolve around, including climate adaptation, conservation planning, and design. And, and you can see the rest here. So I'm sure that those of you who work in marine protected areas can see yourself in some of these themes as well. So that's just a really quick thumbnail sketch of the LCC network. Again, 22 LCCs who have their own steering committees are determining what's needed at the local level, all working to, together collectively at the network level to really make a, a difference for conservation on the ground and, and identify the priority areas and figure out collectively what our, what our part is in helping achieve those long -term, that long-term collective vision that's been established. So I wanted to give you a few examples of some of the work that's happening in, in the coastal and marine oceanic um, ecosystems that involve some of the LCCs. Again, 14 of our 22 LCCs are coastal in nature, and several of them focus primarily on the coast. Others of them focus on terrestrial as well as coastal issues. And, and then there's others that also focus on aquatic, um, aquatic needs. And again, it's dependent on the nature of those folks who are at the the partnership level of the steering committee to determine the priorities for their for their LCC. So I wanted to start with the South Atlantic Landscape Conservation Cooperative, um, just because this tells a little bit of a story of, of what an LC and in one individual LCC is. And you can see again, it spans numerous state boundaries as well as federal agencies. 
There's over 89 million acres there that includes the terrestrial, freshwater, and marine environments. It's hugely privately held. 92% of the land is in private ownership. And there's, as with many areas, expected to be a tremendous um, increase in the population um, in the next few decades there. Wanted to, to again bring this example to give this is a representative steering committee. So you can see that many of the federal partners are represented, including NOAA. Um, all of the state agencies are represented and uh, many NGOs as well. So this is truly a, a collaborative, uh, a cooperative collaborative that is in existence. And I know that one of the steering committee chairs is actually on this call today. So if you have specific questions, you could, you could ask her about this steering committee. So the South Atlantic LCC's mission was to create a shared blueprint, again, that shared vision for what needs to happen across the landscape and the seascape that will help sustain the natural and cultural resources. Instead of the state of North Carolina just doing its own thing and the state of Georgia doing its own thing, they're coming together collectively and finding out where they can harness the power collectively to really do, to be more effective at what they're all trying to achieve in their, within their own individual missions. So they integrated um, existing plans. This just shows the conservation plans on the terrestrial side. But you'll see what they've ended up creating um, is this blueprint of priority areas that definitely includes a large marine component as well. The, the NOAA was, was heavily involved in the development of this. And um, so these are the areas that were identified by that stakeholder group as the priority areas for conservation. This was the first version they had to, you know, they wanted to get the first version out there so that people could really think about it and, and move forward and starting to use it. They are already busy at work. This was released last year, last spring, and now they're busy at work getting ready to do the revision and, and create um, South Atlantic Blueprint 2.0. And if you are in the Southeast region, the South Atlantic LCC, I would encourage you to go check out their website if you haven't already. They're already getting ready to their scheduling workshops and some of them are, are closed and so I would I would get involved if you aren't and um, sign up and participate in these workshops to help create a, an even better revision and a more re refined vision for for the South Atlantic <coughs> excuse me so this is actually leading into um, the 15 Southeast Fish and Wildlife Agency directors came to the LCCs and asked them to do something similar for the entire southeast region of the United States. And so underway is the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy. And this update was printed, presented to the directors at their meeting in, in October. It's expected to be completed. It's still a work in progress, but it's expected to be completed in uh, fall of 2016. Basically, again, six LCCs coming together, mostly along the Gulf Coast here. Um, identifying those areas that are the highest priority for conservation. Again, in, in Florida and the South Atlantic LCC are, are uh, pretty much a, really ahead of the group with, with having done a lot of this work already. And so some of the, the other work is still very preliminary, but, but very much underway. And so again, this is a great opportunity for marine protected areas to become involved in this Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy effort and really identify these areas that are going to have the highest conservation values that collectively all these states and all of the federal natural resource agencies in the southeast are going to be really focusing on and putting their energies on uh, together collectively. So this gives you sort of a, a kind of a longer version of, of what an LCC and multiple LCCs coming together can do. And again, hopefully it gives you a little bit of a flavor of um, what the partnership is like for the South Atlantic LCC. Moving on to other examples, there's tremendous numbers, and I have quite a few examples of for the Gulf of Mexico. Within the Gulf of Mexico, most, most of you are really aware that there are a ton of upstream issues. There's enough issues in the Gulf itself, but, but much of what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico is dependent on what's going on upstream. So we have the, the agriculture belt along the Mississippi River Basin, which, which is helping contribute to nutrient overloading in that whole watershed and uh, leading to diminished water quality and habitats. There has been a long-term effort underway to address Gulf hypoxia. There's a, there's a whole working group that is, that is addressing that, but there hadn't really been a wildlife base on that, and that's where LCCs have come in. So this entire 
central region of the, the Mississippi Basin of the United States actually spans seven different LCCs um, within that Mississippi River Basin. And these seven LCCs have come together with all the partners, brought the partners together to really think about Gulf hypoxia and developing wildlife corridors along this Mississippi River Basin as they try to continue to um, augment the efforts that are going on in, in the Gulf hypoxia issue. So one of the questions they asked is, what if we had a mutually reinforcing plan of action? Again, addressing these areas, aligning the conservation that's going on in the upper Mississippi River Basin to achieve these multiple objectives. So they organized and last fall held a, a large structured decision-making workshop and helped to identify the key scientific uncertainties that are associated with that large monster geography that no one by themselves can help tackle, can tackle alone. Um, and they've started to um, begin to use that structured decision-making in identifying these priority watersheds and, and mapping where they can have the most, um, most cost-effective effect by uh, targeting perhaps agricultural practices and, and um, providing things that are more beneficial to agriculture, but also minimizing the effects of runoff and, and improving water quality as well as wildlife conservation. So again, a tremendous effort that, that NOAA is involved in, but again, it's, it's more upstream and it's, it's thinking about how to maybe use your LCCs that aren't necessarily coastal, but that would uh, potentially, that geography is, is very critical and important to helping to, to, uh, to your coastal systems or your ocean systems within your marine protected areas. So continuing on the Gulf of Mexico theme, um, another thing that's going on, you can see everybody knows the Gulf of Mexico, or at least I do because I spent so much time down there, how important the Gulf of Mexico is to the economy, to the culture. Uh, it, it produces oil and gas, has huge uh, sustainable fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico. We were constantly facing harmful algal blooms when I was in Florida. Um, there's coral reefs out there. Just a tremendous ecosystem in the Gulf of Mexico. We're affected by, by hurricanes, um, all, all sorts of things going on out there. And, and so there's a lot of work already going on through GOMA and other, the, the Gulf of Mexico Alliance and, and other initiatives within the Gulf of Mexico. And that's been exacerbated now and com compounded by the, the um, I was going to say Exxon Valdez, but the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and all the efforts that are going on with restoration there. And so the four LCCs here, the, the concern is really how do we protect and restore all of this coastal habitat, and again, the coastal communities that are so dependent on and love to live on the coast. How do we protect them? How do we help them in the face of sea level rise? Because we've seen the pictures of what, you know, projections for potential effects from sea level rise, and it's, it's really not pretty. So the LCCs got together with some of the, the other partners, including NOAA, and um, are looking at, at completing a Gulf vulnerability assessment to sea level rise and land use change um, later this year. And it, it builds on the existing Gulf of Mexico conservation initiatives, and I think that this is going to be really helpful to the marine protected areas um, and other other federal agencies and state agencies and, and the efforts going on with Gulf restoration in general related to the oil spill. So again, another good example of the LCCs pulling partners together, thinking about what the vulnerabilities are and, and, and um, doing this on a very large landscape scale uh, context, again, using four different LCCs to do this. So shifting gears and moving up to those folks who aren't on the uh, the salty side of things and going to the Great Lakes, uh, the Upper Midwest and Great Lakes LCC uh, has taken on as one of their focuses, focus areas to restore the connectivity between the Great Lakes and all the tributaries. And this is a huge deal. You can see here on, this, on the left the picture of a culvert just completely smashed in with a road going over it and that really limits the connectivity for the for the water flow, for fish passage, and, and so many things that are important in making sure that there's good um, flow to the Gulf between the, the Great Lakes and, and all of the tributaries that are so uh, important to the to local co communities and economies. So the issue was, um, what do we do? Do we do we take out barriers? Do we remove them? Do we retain them? It's just a, it's a huge challenge that has been facing almost everybody that's been thinking about conservation in the Great Lakes Basin for, for, for decades now. 
and it's, it's really overwhelming. They went and actually mapped out where the barriers were and found that there were over 270,000 potential barriers around the Great Lakes Basin, and I'll show you a map in a minute. Um, and then also went and determined whether or not those barriers were passable, and they, they uh, assigned ratings to them. And then the next thing is to figure out, again, LCC is providing science, which barriers provide them, you know, removing which barriers provide the most benefit. Um, and so some researchers at the University of Wisconsin and a couple of other partners got together with some funding from the LCC and developed an optimization model to look at this. And the, the other big concern that we have is if you take out a barrier, are you going to introduce invasive species such as Asian, Asian carp and other things that you really don't want in those tributaries. So it's, it's a very complicated issue that folks are having to address. So here's the map. The blue picture, the dark blue on this map is all of the road crossings that are, are the potential barriers. And then the red that you see scattered throughout are dams. So these are all of the barriers leading to, or potential barriers leading to the Great Lakes and affecting their tributaries. Pretty mind-boggling when you see that, that whole, you can see the Great Lakes just be outline just from the, the road crossing. So in this study, and, and I'm not an expert on this study by any means, and it's, it's fairly preliminary at this point, they did a modeling exercise to look at if you had X number of dollars, um, which are the areas, you know, what, what combination of areas, if you remove the barriers, would increase the available habitat. And it was uh, really interesting for me to hear about this study because it, it wasn't a linear type study. If you had $200,000, you would remove X, Y, and Z barrier, and then if you had $400,000, you'd remove X, Y, Z, and then A, B, and C. It, it doesn't work like that. It actually does an optimization so that um, it may be that X, Y, and Z would fall out if you had $400,000, and, and another combination of, of barrier removal would really uh, increase the available habitat. So I think this is really going to help uh, managers think about um, how to focus dollars when they're looking at um, trying to improve available habitat and remove some of those barriers to the Great Lakes. Something else that the Great Lakes and um, LCC is doing is designing uh, the information management and delivery system. They're a part of that. There's a tremendous amount of activity going on surrounding the Great Lakes. There's the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, which is a part of the LCC, and all sorts of organizations and information being collected and it's all over the place and and um, it's again that the tried and true problem that many of us face in that so many people are collecting information but it's all disparate it's all in different places and some you may not know about what one person's doing or what another person's doing and you may be doing the same thing and so one of the things that this LCC steering committee came together and agreed was important was helping to develop an information management and delivery system which will allow for a more centralized location for people to be able to come and identify and, and figure out what's going on uh, in the Great Lakes area. And, and hopefully, again, going back to one of the goals of the LCC and really providing more effective, efficient conservation. So that's the Upper Midwest and Great Lakes. Moving to the West Coast, we have the, the California LCC in green and the North Pacific LCC on, in yellow spans all the way down uh, from Mexico, all the way up through Canada, along the coast into Alaska. And they have gotten together and are working closely with uh, the land management and the marine, uh, marine managers and developing a sea level rise model for the entire Pacific coast. And they uh, worked on this the past couple of years. It is, um, again, providing high quality local data, downscaled models, and projected storm effects specifically for the managers of the, the NERS and the National Wildlife Refuges along the coast. And so you can see some of those highlighted here in this. This is uh, science work that has been uh, in cooperation with the two climate science centers in, on the Pacific coast. So this is an example of some of the outputs from that modeling. This is the Tijuana River estuary. What they have done is they have shown the decadal trans, uh, transformation of the tidal marsh, so starting in 2011 here on the top left, and then hitting 2020, 2030, and so on, all the way through uh, 2110. I can't even hardly say that. And it shows the difference, the changes, the projected changes that are expected 
um, at certain uh, sea level rises um, based on, on um, what happens with the sea level and the vegetation change over time. So they have held uh, workshops with all of the managers for these, these marine areas and the, and the wildlife refuges and identified their priority resources and, and impacts and then um, those results from this modeling effort are being incorporated now into the local and coastwide planning and adaptation strategies. And I believe that you had a, a presentation from uh, Dr. Hutto, I think with the Gulf of the Farallons, um, about this in more detail previously. So that's California or the Pacific, the Pacific Coast in general. And then moving up to the, the last example that I had to share with you today, and I could have provided a whole lot more, but is Western Alaska. And Alaska is definitely on the front lines of, of climate change. They're facing a tremendous number of, of uh, challenges, diminished sea ice buffers, increased vulnerability to coastal storms, uh, more frequent inundation from, from, from those storms and, and, and generally from, from sea level rise. And, and this has been a real challenge. There's a lot of these communities in western Alaska are very remote. There's, it's very difficult to get to them and, and they're fairly isolated. Um, so what the Western Alaska LCC has, has done is come together with the Climate Science Center in Alaska with NOAA and some researchers from, from Notre Dame and, and um, have actually provided, this is, this is a really good example of, there was information that was really critical to these folks in Alaska. They're very, they tend to be pretty data poor in terms of conservation data and so there were no circulation models available for Alaska that, that were needed by just about everybody, but there were nobody's responsibility. And so the Western Alaska LCC was able to come in along with Alaskan LCC and, and provide that, fill that science gap, fill that data gap that was needed. And since then, there have been so uh, numerous studies that have peered off of that information that was collected uh, from that particular study to the point now that there are um, NOAA folks who are creating storm surge flood maps for Alaska, which you know may sound common in the in the lower 48, but is something that they desperately needed to help them with their emergency forecasting. As you can see, this village almost completely completely inundated on the right hand side. So this is again an example of the LCC being able to come in and provide um, support to a greater need for the conservation community that. Again, the, the, the information was needed, but it wasn't anybody's responsibility, and, and so they were able to fill that important data gap there. So I wanted to, to touch on, here's the, the map from the Marine Protected Areas website that shows where all the marine protected areas are, and so we've touched on how the LCCs are working in the South Atlantic and in the Gulf of Mexico and the Great Lakes and the Pacific and in Alaska. I didn't, I didn't give any examples specific to the North Atlantic or the Pacific Islands, but I, I could have done that as well. But I, I hope you've gotten a little bit of a taste of some of what the LCCs are doing. Again, filling data gaps, providing landscape conservation designs as a collaborative partnership, and, and moving conservation forward collectively in, in these big challenges that we're facing. So again, we're, we're creating these forums to bring the partners together to set those shared conservation priorities and help fill those gaps um, to really improve our conservation of coastal and marine ecosystems. So I was asked to, to mention briefly how you might get involved and how you might stay informed. And so there's a few bullets here. And I, I will be providing this um, presentation as a PDF to the, the organizers so they can distribute it to anybody who wants it. But I would encourage you to sign up for our LCC Network e-newsletter. Uh, you can find that on the front page, a, a little button um, at lccnetwork.org. We send that out about every two months. We're a little behind right now, and it's pretty short and an easy read. Um, I would encourage you to connect with the LCC coordinators and science coordinators in the LCCs that overlap the region that you're, you're managing. I would encourage you to get involved with those steering committees for those LCCs and, and be a part of the, the the collaborative that's developing those shared goals and priorities. Um, for those of you at NOAA, I also would encourage you to reach out to Brady Phillips, who is your LCC coordinator for NOAA. He's my counterpart there at NOAA and great guy to work with. And then we also have uh, a council, an LCC council representative from NOAA. And right now it's it's being filled, um, shared right now between Michael Weiss and Buck Sutter. And, and they're both very much interested and engaged in LCCs. And I would encourage you to 
to talk with them. So at this point, here's a picture of the Pacific Islands from the Pacific Islands Climate Change Co Cooperative, our LCC there. Um, since I didn't talk about them, I thought I'd share a, a picture of them. And you can imagine that they are really uh, dealing with climate change and sea level rise issues in the, in the islands all the way out to Micronesia. And um, would love, I'm sure they would love to have the opportunity to tell you more about what they're doing out there. So any questions? Okay, Please. Elsa, thank you so much. I think that was a terrific overview and some great examples of the work that's going on. Uh, so I would just invite people to go ahead and put your questions into the question interface on the, um, on the webinar interface. I see that the, some questions have already come up, so I'll go ahead and start uh, with those. Uh, there's a question from Eric Vogelbacher who's asking, what agencies are the Canadian representatives from, and are they working with individual LCCs or just the LCC Council? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Yes, so um, they are, they range, they kind of span the gamut. The two folks that I have worked with the most are Eric Schroff, with his, who is with Yukon. He's their director of parks, so he's actually with one of the provinces. And then the other is Madeline Malley, who is, and these are the two council representatives, and she is with um, British Columbia. Um, with that government, we have some Canadian Wildlife Service um, participants as well in some of the other individual LCCs. I should say that Madeline and, and Eric, so Yukon and, and British Columbia, are actively engaged, and that's how they came to be a part of the LCC Council. They're actively engaged, Eric, in the Northwest Boreal LCC, um, which spans half the geographies in Alaska and half is in Canada, and that steering committee in particular is half Canadian and half uh, U.S. Alaskan, um, and they meet once a year in Canada, once a year in, in, uh, in uh, Alaska. And Madeline is very involved, heavily engaged in the Great Northern LCC as well as I think the North Pacific. So there's, there's great engagement there from a, a tremendous number of folks, more local but also some Canadian Wildlife Service. Okay. Um, here's sort of a philosophical question. How do you prevent the LCCs from becoming so integrative across so many subjects that they don't have as much of an impact because they're spread so thin? Oh, that's a great, uh, great question. That's, I think that's going to be up to those LCCs to really hone in on what the, you know, the steering committees, the partners that come to the table to really set those objectives. I think one of the things that is limiting is the, the funding, and that may, may end up being the, the prevent preventative, so to speak, because you, you do have limited dollars and they'll only go so far. And so the LCCs really are trying to find where they can have the most impact and, and most added value. I, I think that's also probably something that the LCC Council would start looking at if it, if, if it looked like it would become a problem and, and provide guidance, perhaps. Okay. Um, here's a question from Peg Brady here at NOAA who's asking, are there any examples of partnerships among the LCCs, steering committees, and the regional planning bodies or, or regional ocean governance organizations? And I, I know you mentioned the Gulf of Mexico Alliance, but do you um, have any information on uh, how they're interacting with the regional planning bodies or in other regions? That is a great question, and I, I honestly don't know the answer. I don't know, you know the makeup of all 22 LCCs. I, I assume that they are involved in some of them, but probably not all of them. But I, I really don't know the answer. I could, you know, if you wanted to email me offline, I could dig up that answer for you. Okay. Uh, and uh, again, another coordination question. Do you know to what extent the LCCs work with IUS, regional associations, to get observational data, modeling, and decision tools? I, I'm not quite sure what IUS is. So okay, I, I'm, I'm slipping into <laughs> NOAA jargon here. And <laughs> IUS is the Integrated Ocean Observing System. Oh, okay, and okay. So that's a national scale program, and then there are regional associations of uh, agencies, universities, others who do ocean monitoring who are networked together on a regional basis. Gotcha. I, I wish some of the coordinators who were on the phone could speak up um, because I'm not specifically, again, familiar with all of the LCCs. I'm pretty sure that in Alaska they would be integrated with them if there is such a system in Alaska because that's one of the, the things that especially the Western Alaska LCC is doing is really um, expanding it, even temperature monitors. There's, there's more temperature monitors in um, in in D.C. than there are in the whole entire state of Alaska. And so that's something that they're working on is just being able to monitor stream temperatures. 
Um, but honestly, but again, I, I'm not as familiar, sorry, with the individual um, I/O systems within each of the LCCs. And, and that's okay. You know, some of these questions, which are really good, are, are making me think these might be good subjects uh, to be taken up at, at yes. the uh, council level, maybe, or, or or to talk with Brady and yeah, um, exactly. Mike Sutter and Michael Weiss. Yes. Okay. Um, can uh, can you talk about the level of tribal participation in the LCC Council and which tribes are represented? This is from Joe Schumacher. Sure. So right now we have we have three positions available on the council for um, tribal representatives. Currently, we have only one of those is filled, and that's with um, Terry Williams of the Tulalip Tribe, who is also an active member of the um, North Pacific LCC. We are actively seeking um, to fill those other two um, positions. We had several nominations, but they were all from the Pacific Northwest, so we were hoping to um, diversify and have more of a geographic spread of tribal representation on the council. Okay. Happily um, take any ideas. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about where the funding for the LCCs comes from? Sure. It is primarily funded through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service budget request. Um, about 18, 18 of the LCCs are um, funded and staffed by Fish and Wildlife Service employees. Uh, there's four or five of the LCCs that are run by other bureaus within Department of Interior, so Bureau of Reclamation, National Park Service, and um, Bureau of Land Management. We also have numerous states, such as the state of Florida and the state of Tennessee, who provide staffing to the LCCs. Um, and while that primary, that preliminary seed money for the LCCs generally comes from the Fish and Wildlife Service, we've had a tremendous amount of um, match and um, shared in-kind resources that have contributed to LCCs that have come from states other federal agencies, NGOs, and other partners within the LCC. Okay. But we're the just, only ones with a line item budget on it. <laughs> and just a related question on funding uh, from Molly McCammon, who says, uh, since the LCCs were not funded in the same years and are not funded equally, is there going to be a chance to equalize, she puts that in quotes, among them, the funding? That's, that's the, the tried and true question. And, and what Molly's referring to is that we originally had uh, five years ago, nine of the LCCs were stood up, and they received the bulk of the of the funding between the nine of them. And then over the last three of the three years following, we had the additional um, the additional LCCs were stood up, and that same pot of money was still was was available. So it had to be reduced to those original nine to to fund the next set, and then the final set really um, hasn't received as much funding as the others. Um, so that's just sort of some background for the rest of you to clarify um, the question a little bit. And we've struggled a lot with how we would go about um, doing that. The, the concern is right now we have a lot of some of the LCCs that received a lot of a uh, lot more funding than others are really doing amazing work. All of the LCCs are doing amazing work. And do you really penalize them by taking money away from them to give them to some of the ones that more that were stood up later? And, you penalize the ones that were stood up later because they came up later. Um, so really what we're hoping is that we would get a budget increase that could help you know, equalize. Ultimately, we would like to see each of the LCCs have about a $2.5 million budget. Um, none of them are at that point at this yet, but we would, in, in the future, that's where we would like to see the funding. Okay. And Molly also added in her comment that uh, in Alaska, the regional IUs program is working very closely with the Alaska LCCs and that they are great partners. Thank you. I assumed that was the case, but... And I, and I saw that there was another comment from uh, the, one of the IUs coordinators, Josie Quintrell, who also uh, was very interested in continuing to make links between the IUs regional associations and the LCCs. So I, um, I will follow up with Brady and maybe we can... Uh, explore that a little bit more. Perfect. Uh, so other questions. Um, John Rooney is asking, what's happening with the LCC in the Pacific Islands? Oh, it's amazing. They, they have been able, that's an example of a group of folks that have already been working together when this LCC, that, which, what, which we actually call the CCC, is the Climate Conservation Cooperative. They are focusing their efforts on climate and, um, and uh, 
a sea level rise and they've done vulnerability assessments for a lot of the species that they have. And they have a lot of unique um, indigenous species there in, in Hawaii that are potentially affected. And, uh, and they actually are having a science workshop next week um, that I wish I could go to, but I can't, um, to talk more about some of the results that they've, that they've produced recently. They're, they're thinking about how they would do landscape conservation design for a geography that spans um, I, I can't even tell you how big you guys know better than I do the, 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 the oceanic uh, reach that it has from, from Hawaii all the way out to Micronesia and um, really trying to think about how they would design their seascape. Okay. Um, Peg Brady has another question here asking, do you have examples of performance measures that the LCCs are using or can you talk more broadly about how they are um, looking at evaluation? Sure. So there's um, there's there's two parts to that question because you start talking about scale. You've got the the self-directed partnerships, the the, the 22 LCCs, and um, as, as I had mentioned in the very beginning, each of them has their own science plan. Most of them have their own um, set objectives and goals, and so they would have um, their own evaluation tools to help them determine how they're progressing towards their their goals and, and objectives and um, I know the Pacific Islands is working closely with some of the with the the RISA, the NOAA RISA there to develop and some of the researchers there to develop performance me measures specific to the Pacific Islands. Um, and that's true of some of the other LCCs. From a US Fish and Wildlife standpoint, a tool was developed which we call SIAS, the Science Investment and Accountability Schedule. And it's really um, designed it's, we we ask all of the coordinators, so each of the 22 LCCs every year responds to these 22 questions in this um, in this SIAS tool that we've developed, and they are all um, mostly focused on on basically what we call strategic habitat conservation in the Fish and Wildlife Service, but it is, is adaptive management. So it looks at how um, if, if the LCCs have developed um, biological objectives or cultural resource objectives if they're um, doing landscape conservation design. Um, it, it looks at the partnerships and how well the partnerships are established. And um, we're, we're happy to share that tool with anybody who wants to take a look at, at the specifics of it. Great. Um, a question from Robert McGuinn asking, how can deep sea coral and sponge habitats be fully integrated into this process? There's a lot of crossover with oil and gas exploration and deep sea mining. And, and I would just add, I think, uh, the map you showed us of the South Atlantic was really fascinating to see the conservation areas that continued and went right offshore um, and would be interested in, in hearing if that kind of process is being looked at by other LCCs. I, I can't comment specifically on the individual. Some of the LCCs are looking that far offshore um, and again it depends on the partners who come to the table. So. Um, if, if there's a, a NOAA representative on, say, the, the Gulf Coast Plains LCC Steering Committee and they're doing their part of the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy and they decide they want to go, you know, 200 miles offshore into the Gulf of Mexico to, to help establish their priorities, um, then that would be a really important voice to have at the table to help, help that steering committee set those priorities out there. And, and that's how I would encourage folks that are interested in those, those offshore um, issues is really get involved with that LCC and, and, and bring those priorities to the table and have that as part of the planning process. And that's what happened in the South Atlantic. We had the NOAA folks at the table that were, you know, brought that expertise and knowledge of the importance of those areas. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call for any more questions. We, we uh, have one more that I'm going to ask here in a second, but I just wanted to um, encourage you all, if you do still have questions, go ahead and type those in. Uh, here's another question related to funding, um, and it, it gets into the details of asking, um, is most of the funding for projects, or is there sort of core funding that for uh, full-time personnel? And it sounds like you were talking about staff that are supported, but curious about the relationship between um, sort of core staff and also how much project-level funding there is. Great, great question. So there, there are two separate categories, and I'm new to the federal system, so I don't really understand how that works, and they're probably all different. But. There's two categories of funding that the LCCs receive through the Fish and Wildlife Service. 
And when I say that some LCCs haven't been funded, that's not true. All of them have the funding for the staffing. So all LCCs receive a certain amount of funding that allows them to hire the coordinator and the science coordinator. Some of them have used additional funding to hire communications and, like I said, some of the other technical staff. So all of the LCCs are staffed um, and have funding for that. The other um, pot of money, so to speak, is the, the science dollars. And um, you, you refer to it as project dollars. It may or may not be projects. It's, it's really looking at where, where, this, where some funding, and again, it it's, could be fairly minimal. It could be more. It just depends on the LCC. I think it range, ranges from about um, maybe, well, from zero, basically, to 200 to maybe up to, up to 500 or $700,000 a year. And again, it depends on Congress and how much money they allocate to this, this um, program. And that funding is then um, available to the LCCs to, to target the priority, fill data gaps, um, convene folks, you know, do what, what the needs of that partnership are. Okay. All right. Uh, and here's another question from Patty Snow, who's asking, do the LCCs work with state coastal programs? And she's noting that the coastal zone managers would also be another audience that would be very interested in addition to the NERS managers that you mentioned. Yes, and I would, I would love to talk to them. I know that um, we, were, we were starting to work with the coastal zone management program in, in Florida, um, and I'm sure that's happening in other places as well, pro probably on the, on the Pacific coast where you saw the, the sea level rise work being done. Um, again, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact specifics of everything, but yeah, I would, you know, and again, work with Brady and would love to, to get as, in, as, as many facets of NOAA as we can involved in this, because I think it's important work, and I think, we, I think it's the way of the future. We're going to have to be working together and collectively figuring this out. You can't separate the terrestrial side from the, from the marine side at all. They're all connected, and, and, and more brain and more brains and more expertise that we can bring to the table collectively, it's amazing the things that can be accomplished. Yeah, I think we all agree. And, and I would just comment that I, I noticed you used a lot of examples of work going on on sea level rise. And obviously, that's an interest of you know, huge importance to coastal managers, marine protected area managers, all the folks who are working along the coast. And it, I'm not surprised to see that it has bubbled up as a, as a critical you know, issue that the, a lot of the LCCs are focused on. Okay, I'm just going to call one more time for any last questions. Um, and while I do that, I would just point out that Elsa has put her contact information here. And we are going to be um, making sure that she gets a copy of all the questions that were asked uh, to, in today's meeting. So, uh, so if she needs to follow up with any of you, she'll have your email and you'll have hers. And we will post this presentation on the MPA Center website and also the recording on open channels. So if any of you uh, missed any part of the beginning, you can, you can go ahead and listen to the whole thing there. All right. Well, I think uh, you have answered a lot of questions, and I think you've tapped out our audience for the moment. And we have certainly a lot of ideas about future collaboration that have come up through this discussion. So again, Elsa, I just wanted to thank you so much for being here, and uh, we really appreciate it. Great, thank you, and please be in touch. We, we do want to better partner with everybody, and we know you guys are doing great work and, and would love to figure out how to better integrate.